Hi, and welcome back. This is Disability Saves the World with Dr. Fadi Shinuda. I am Fadi Shinuda. This podcast brings you insights from leading experts in disability and math studies from around the world. You'll hear about the research and work of disabled scholars, activists, artists, and our allies. You'll also get some insight into their lives, their favorite non-DS activities, hobbies, and adventures. Most importantly, you'll hear how they think disability can save the world. My name is Fadi Shinuda. I use he, him pronouns and identify as a fat, disabled cis man of color. If you don't know me, hopefully you'll get to know me over the course of this podcast. On today's show, I am joined by Dr. Jihan Abbas, who uses she, her pronoun. Uh, Dr. Abbas teaches courses and does service at the Ryerson School of Disability Studies. She's also a researcher at Dawn Canada, the Disabled Women's Network. I'm excited to speak with her about her work. What I'm doing informally right now that's been about COVID and mostly informed through my brother's experience um, is probably for me the most important because it's the most critical and it's right in front of us. I've really been tied up sort of in the COVID policy and specifically right now the vaccine access. Her life outside of research. I got into feeding squirrels um, throughout COVID, which I really, really enjoy. Uh, I've got to sort of roll it back a little bit because I think I've artificially um, grown the squirrel population on my blog. And to ask her how she thinks disability can save the world. Hi, Jihan. Thank you again for coming on the podcast. I'm really looking forward to our conversation. I want to jump right into the first segment um, called Inside the Project, the Research, the Work, the Art. I want to know why disability studies. Oh, wow. Why disability studies? I I think for me, disability studies, I have learning disabilities. Um, So, I mean, in part, I've always been interested in this, but my younger brother has Down syndrome. um, And so his experiences have been far different than mine in terms of he never was able to go to a community school. He was always in segregated programs, schools and classrooms. Um, He couldn't go you know, even the local community center, the classes they had, he couldn't do the same classes that my sister and I could do. So I was always interested in disability issues, primarily from his standpoint, just because his experience, he was excluded so much. Um, And I sort of stumbled into disability studies. I, when I went, um, I did a college degree first, a developmental service worker. And I kind of did that because I couldn't figure out what to do Mm -hmm. Um, But I wanted to understand more about the services that supported my brother. Um, A little bit horrified when I did that in terms of the way people thought about disabled people and how they supported them and their families. So I I sort of went on to university. And at the time, um, disability studies was fairly new. And the only place I could find um, anything that did disability studies, I went to the University of Ottawa and they had a leisure studies program. Mm -hmm. And they sort of had a therapeutic recreation component. Um, So I sort of found my way into disability through that. Um, But as well, there was a little bit uncomfortable because it was that therapeutic piece. Uh, And then when I did my master's, I ended up at OISE and Catherine Church was teaching there. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I took my first sort of formal disability studies class. And it was just, it was like a huge light bulb moment um, because it was between you know, it merged my experiences, my brother's experiences, the experiences I saw other people were happening. It started to answer questions, you know, all the whys I had in terms of exclusion and barriers um, and pointed to the bigger systemic things. Um, So that's really what got me there. And then I think like a lot of people, once I found disability studies, um, I just found so many people who had similar experiences, who were interested in the same things, who were fighting for the same things. And it's so interdisciplinary. It was really a way to merge every single interest <laughs> that I had sort of in this one field. I want to like ask you about the contrast between like what you were being taught in, you know, the first kind of degree that you were doing the, the or the, in the leisure course and versus what Catherine, who was at some point the director of the School of Disability Studies at Ryerson, um, in this disability studies course, 
do you have a recollection from like what was off-putting at one point and what was really rewarding at the other end? Well, I, I think up until sort of disability studies in Catherine Church, um, disability was still, if you were looking at it, even within sort of leisure studies, like it, it just, it othered people and it made people the problem. So I remember in one course I took, um, the, the course was supposed to be about taking uh, recreation programs and making them accessible. Um, but the person teaching it do sort of nothing about disability. They just sort of been parachuted in oh, no. um, and they had really terrible ideas about disability. And they had people doing these group projects and going up and presenting. And there was this moment that this one group was talking about how you could make touch football accessible. Uh, and it was terrible. They talked about like Velcro gloves and Velcro on the balls and you could put Velcro all over the people in their helmets. So even if they couldn't catch the ball would stick to them. And I think they got like an A and it was just this sort of like horrific moment where it was like, well, that's not why recreation's inaccessible, you know, and it was all these stereotypes about people with disabilities and what they could do and what they couldn't do. And it was just, it, like it, it stuck with me like all these years later because you know I was sitting in that classroom and like 99% of the people in the classroom thought that was a brilliant presentation and these were people who were going to go into programming and rec centers and things and it just it horrified me and I sort of thought back of all my brother's experiences and barriers and you know programs that he started but then left because he was treated so poorly uh, and it you know I felt really hopeless and then mm. when I ended up in Catherine's class um, it was just, you know, the beginning of critical disability studies and, and the questions were all asked from a different viewpoint and Catherine was so, she just validated people's lived experiences and she talked to us, there were a number of us um, who had disabilities but were also siblings and she sort of had a conversation with us about how many siblings came into her classes and, you know, what that means in terms of what we're growing up and what might scar us versus what people might think scars us. Um, and so I, you know, had this connection with Catherine and then I connected with other scholars. Um, and it just, it was the first time that sort of I felt safe and comfortable to discuss disability and things like disability pride that, you know, never would have been talked about or, or even intersectionality you know, bringing that into the lens of disability studies. And it was just sort of this, that class was absolutely mind blowing between sort of the theories that we learned, the conversations we could have, and it was a small group. Um, Catherine's leadership, I had never sort of had an instructor who evaluated students like that. You know, Catherine's mm -hmm. approach was very much, what are you doing well? It wasn't like there's gonna be red pen marks all over your paper. Um, you know, and encouraging us the, the things in our writing that were strong or the observations we were making. And it just, it, it sort of that class changed everything. It introduced me to disability studies. It showed me there was another way of looking at things. Uh, and it also showed me there was another way of teaching and learning um, that I think is maybe a lot of times unique to what's happening in disability studies, just because there's that merging of lived experience and activism that kind of informs um, that scholarship. So I don't know if that answers your question, but it was just such a, a, such a contrast to where I'd been. And for the first time, it was like, well, I can have these conversations and not feel, feel judged, not feel pity, not feel like all those things I'm used to feeling. Yeah. And I'm like, and you're, you telling the story about like this assignment that got an A plus and both like horrified and laughing a little bit. And you know what I mean? Because it, it does, it does bring up that conscious of like, how was this ever thought to be accessible? And then especially when, you know, when you come into a classroom, uh, a Diaz classroom, and then one taught by someone as like awesome as Catherine, uh, you're like, oh, this is what it's supposed to be like. And this is what we yeah. mean. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and, and it's it's weird the first time, I don't know if it was for you that you experience it because it's, it, you know, you don't know what you're missing and then it's right there and you're like, oh. 100%. Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, my my experience was with uh, Dr. Jeffrey Reum, right? And um, and with and Dr. Um, Nancy Viva Davis Halifax at York. So, you know, those were the kind of 
to folks and be like, oh, there's actually an entirely different way that we can do this. Yeah. 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 And, and you forget because I, I think the world is just so ableist. Right. And I mean, conversely, now that I'm more emerged in critical disability studies and activism, you almost sometimes get a reminder mm. because you're in this comfortable space where you can have these conversations and then you open up the news and it's like, oh, yeah. Right. Exactly. Not everybody's here. <laughs> yeah. And and speaking about not everyone's here, I wonder, like, what is the kind of current project or topic or like kind of area that you're you're tackling or you're researching on right now? You know, I've, I've sort of done a number of things. I think what I'm doing informally right now that's been about COVID and mostly informed through my brother's experience um, is probably for me the most important because it's the most critical and it's right in front of us. Right. Um, and just from the very beginning, I, I remember even before it was officially a pandemic, my brother has a compromised immune system. Um, so in the past, you know, things like H1N1, like whenever those things kind of kick up, we get a little bit more vigilant. Um, so we had already started to be vigilant. We had stopped kind of going out in public, wearing masks, things like that, just to be really, really careful with his immune system. Um, and then when it became the pandemic and these policies were rolling out really, really quickly, you could see, you could see how disability was excluded. And it was really for me troubling because on the one hand, we had people saying, don't worry, unless you're disabled, you'll be fine. Um, but on the other hand, there were no policies that acknowledged this kind of dominant narrative. Like we all understand who's vulnerable. Um, and of course, not just disabled people, but through intersectionality, poor people, um, you know, frontline workers, like we sort of knew all that, but the policies they weren't responding to that. And it, it sort of feels like this entire pandemic, things have moved so quickly and policies have been rolled out. And then as a community and self-advocates have had to point out the exclusion and the barriers and the rights violations and sort of fight for them. So I found um, like a, a lot of my time has been spent around vaccine access, which has been an absolute mess for all of us. Yeah. Um, you know, the rollout at different levels of government, there have been sort of all kinds of mistakes, but consistently, um, disabled people and young disabled people have been left off those priority lists, even though we have just mounting data from around the world now, um, that we know disabled people are most at risk, but we, we sort of have had this lazy response where the government has entirely focused on an age-based metric without really thinking through the reasons why we've seen so many older people die and the problems in long-term care. Like they've, they've sort of grasped this as this is the way we're gonna roll out the vaccine because look at what it did without saying, but it did this because we were negligent, <laughs> um, you know, and these, these profit, for-profit long-term care centers. And, and even this morning, I was sort of um, pulled into something, um, a young woman in Ottawa with Down syndrome, I think 44 years old, um, wasn't able to access the vaccine and she's in the ICU now on a ventilator. No. And her family had advocated and advocated that she needed early access. Um, and really here in Ottawa, we've consistently seen with Ottawa Public Health, they've They've continued to fall back on this. It's age-based, it's age-based. Uh, they haven't paid attention to hotspots. Um, and this is all like, like for me, it's troubling because it's preventable. We have known for so long this was coming and we haven't really prioritized the rollout. And the rollout's been built in a way that if you have privilege, you can access those vaccines. Um, and it just, you know, in the era of medical assisted dying and made, um, it shouldn't be easier <laughs> to have access to death and a life-saving vaccine for the people we know are most vulnerable. So a lot of my time has sort of been spent in that and it, it's been connected uh, to advocacy I've done through my brother and then sort of connecting with other people and seeing how incredibly widespread this is. Um, seeing that different local public health units, some have recognized the gaps in the provincial policies and they've addressed it. Um, others have just decided to say, sorry, it's the province. <laughs> Uh, and ignore it. And I mean, this is all it links back to that systemic ableism and constantly sort of having to advocate for disabled people and for access to the same things that other people take for granted. So I've really been tied up sort of in the COVID policy and specifically right now the vaccine access 
um, just almost just because it's necessary. Right. And, and, you know, it's, it's really come down to like the squeaky wheel and, and I've sort of, you know, helped other families and assisted them. And it's just, there's no clear policy. It's who picks up the phone and what they might be responsive to. It's I called 47 times and on the 47th time, somebody finally said yes. Uh, and it, it shouldn't be that way. And, you know, there's, there's a young person in the hospital right now whose family said this is going to happen. And it happened. And where's the accountability? What is your approach to, like, how do you have conversations with folks in these spaces, whether it's public health or whether it's, you know, is there an approach you you come to these spaces with? You know, I, I think sometimes my approach is red hot and it doesn't work right? Sometimes you go in and you're, you're trying to be nice and friendly and that backfires. You know what I mean? Is, is there, is there a, a tested approach that you found actually works? You know, like you, I don't have one approach. It sort of depends on the situation. I found sometimes coming in red hot is gets a response. Other times being sugary sweet gets a response. Like there's really no telling what people will respond to. And I, I think that's been one of my frustrations and it's, mm. it's disability advocacy in general because COVID and the vaccine rollout mirror what it's like for disabled people navigating policies and accessing supports anyways. Absolutely. Um, and it's just, there's no consistency. And that's one of the things that bothers me is these policies that might be very clear for most people, they've been designed for people who are more privileged, who maybe have access to technology, who have time to go through the booking process, who can afford to wait for the vaccine, like things like that. Um, but there's no clear avenue or policy if you're disabled. Like you don't know what's going to work. Sometimes it's going to come down to having a sympathetic caseworker. Um, you know, sometimes that caseworker might be a gatekeeper. Maybe there's a personality conflict and they decide. <laughs> they're going to cut you off from services just because they don't like you. So I don't think there's, unfortunately, there's not one way to be successful because the system isn't built in any logical way. Um, it really comes down to trying different things uh, and in different situations, them sort of responding differently. And with my brother with the vaccine, and I, I like to think I'm pretty good at navigating the system and, and helping him advocate, um, and it really came down to, I finally had to send an email because I wanted everything in writing mm. and say, we've spoken to a lawyer. This is a human rights violation. He's been cleared to get his vaccine. He's been cleared for weeks. And there are little administrative errors and loopholes that people are using to deny him that access. And it was after sort of that legal route that all of a sudden it was like, oh, he can get his vaccine. Um, but it shouldn't take that. And I know so many other people I was speaking to someone in the community who was saying her mother, um, an immigrant, English isn't her first language. And for her, she called, she was um, in one of the hotspots, so she should have been able to access the vaccine and she was of the proper age if you're using an age metric. Um, but she heard no, so she just never called back. Because um, for her, she said her mother culturally, them saying no, it's not your time. Right. It was like, okay, I don't wanna bother anybody. I'm not gonna do this again. Um, and she was eligible for the vaccine and at risk. So there's no one way that works. And, and that's the frustration is we can't give a blueprint to say, do this, do this, do this. Um, Cause the system isn't built that way. It just seems so idiosyncratic, right? Depending on who you get, depending on what system you're in. I mean, I'm, I'm in York region here in, 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 you know, North of Toronto. And it took me uh, 10 minutes to sign up. And it took me 30 minutes to get the vaccine. Nobody asked me any questions. Uh, and the only reason I got it earlier than other people is because my BMI is higher than 40, right? Which is at some point, some doctor said was <laughs> put me at risk, which, you know, I'm only at risk because the medical system doesn't know how to treat fat folks, not because exactly. my body is somehow actually immunocompromised in some ways compared to your brothers. So, I mean, we live in the same province, right? It's like, it's like wild, the, the, mm -hmm. the differences. Um, um, yeah, it's just like, it, it doesn't seem to be about care at all. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That's a perfect way to saying it. 
of saying it, it's not about care at all. I, I'm not entirely sure what it's about at this point, um, but it's certainly not about care. It's not, it's not. So I wonder if there are, um, you know, things that you learned from kind of this process, the vaccine rollout and uh, maybe a desire for the future or a desire for, you know, how this might have been done differently or how we might do it differently in the future. Well, I think what this has illustrated for me is something we've known all along is like fundamentally we need to change the system and there's a lot we need to dismantle. Um, and in the that, that's sort of more long-term, but in the short term, we have to stop doing things without consulting communities and individuals with lived experience because all across the board, we sort of have policies that come out. They're through a very narrow lens. Uh, and then we have to work backwards to point out who's been excluded. Um, and it just doesn't work. And I, I've sort of seen this in my work with Dawn Canada and the research we're doing there is we've really tried to be intersectional and cross disability to pick up um, on those places where people are being left behind. Um, and it's often sort of people with the least amount of privilege, um, maybe invisible disabilities, things like traumatic brain injury, things like that, that maybe aren't easily seen or diagnosed or people aren't given accommodations for. So I do think there are short term things that we can do, um, but we've really sort of got to get, we have to get away from not having you know, people with disabilities lead in these conversations. Um, Cause that's always seems to be what happens is they develop something and then there's some kind of token gesture mm -hmm. for someone to comment on it. And they find somebody who will comment favorably, <laughs> um, you know, and they, they work with those people or those groups. So like it, it just, we really, we, we need that long-term piece, the systemic change, but in the short term, um, like so many things could be solved if people just listen to disabled people. Like it's, it's literally that simple. And, and with a lot of this, we sort of knew the risks, we knew the policies, um, we had the benefit of other places in the world doing things first. So we saw what worked and didn't, uh, and we just couldn't get people to listen. And it's, it, it's mind blowing considering how common disability is to the human experience. Like this is the reality for so many of us. So yeah. the fact that we can't, you know, that it's treated sort of as this fringe issue rather than just a broader public health and sort of part of the makeup of who we are. Uh, it's, it's a little bit mind blowing, but, but I do think there's hope in terms of the work that we're seeing community organizations and young activists and scholars who are really using sort of an intersectional lens and cross disability and asking different questions and, you know, making connections that, um, you know, I just haven't seen made. And, and I just, you know, I, I even think about the last year and, and the social movements we've seen and how intersectional they've been and the nuances and the connections they've made. And it's, it's, it makes me a little bit hopeful that we will get change um, and hopefully learn from this and do something differently going forward. Absolutely. And you're, you remind me of like disability as exceptionality, disability as extraordinary, disability as all these things when in fact disability is so common, it's all around us. And so it's exclusion only ends up harming us, right? Yeah. And, and not just like the people who are uh, you know, intimately in relationships with things that disable them, but all of us who will experience those things in the future. And mm -hmm. so, you know, uh, a hope for change is really about in just including, um, including more people in the conversation so that the future does become like more accessible to a larger group of people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So I want to move on to segment two, what I call the middle or the liminal. Um, I wonder if you have like an academic crush or a writing crush or a researcher crush, someone whose work you are currently in love with. You know, I have many. I am a person like who every time I read something new or see a new theory, it's exciting. <laughs> um, I think right now for me, probably the most exciting thing, um, the work of sins invalid and disability justice, it can be applied to everything. 
And it is so inclusive and so thoughtful in terms of cross-movement solidarity and intersectionality. Um, and it really, for me, when I look at places where there's been exclusion, I mean, almost always you can think if you apply the disability justice lens here, this would this would fix this, this would correct those things. So right now that's incredibly exciting to me. And I love the connections it's making between activism and scholarship. I think it's making critical disability studies more accessible. Right. Um, and even if you look at social media, if you look at the way things have evolved and online, even through things like Twitter, um, you can see how it's informing and educating and changing in a way that I don't know. I don't know if I've ever seen that before, like, like something that accessible that has that big of an impact on the community. Absolutely. Do you have any advice for younger academics or younger researchers? Oh, I, I don't, that's a tough one because it's, and I'm, I'm sure as you know, it's, it's sort of tough as a young academic or researcher and so much of what, like there's so many tensions because I think you sort of come into it with these questions and um, you're hopeful and you want to change things. And then you realize that maybe universities and academia themselves are not <laughs> the freeing progressive places you thought they'd be. And then you uh -uh. find yourself stuck in this system that's replicating the things you thought you were there to dismantle. Um, so I think just going in knowing that, I, I kind of wish somebody had sat me down and <laughs> sort of explained that the things I would encounter, even from people who I looked up to, who was like, oh, this is a huge scholar. I'm so excited to study under them. And then you know, they, they say something terribly ableist and you're like, oh my goodness. <laughs> um, so I kind of wish somebody had prepared me for how sort of human some of the people we look up to are and maybe problematic as well as the institutions themselves are not, um, they're not a place where I think you'll feel comfortable or safe or empowered for a lot of us. So it's good to know that going in because I think knowing that is the first step to finding how you can work within those systems comfortably. Um, and I think for a lot of us, it won't work if we try to replicate um, the way that maybe we were taught or supported. Like it's just, you've got to sort of start from scratch uh, and do things very differently. And, you know, universities are neoliberal places. So they, you know, they're not going to encourage probably the kinds of things we want to do, but to really sort of, acknowledge those tensions, work against them, and know that that discomfort or, you know, not feeling included is, is not something that you're the only person feeling. There's a lot of people that feel that way. And I, I think too, having the freedom to step away from academia and know that your scholarship and activism has a place outside of it. Um, they focus us so much on, you know, a very limited idea what we can do with our training. Um, but you know, you can teach in the community, you can be a facilitator, you can do activist work, you can do, you know, art installations, you can take what you're learning in university and apply it. And I think apply it in better ways <laughs> than maybe they're already applied. So I, I don't know if that's helpful, but those are things I wish I would have known going in and it, it wouldn't have been such an uncomfortable process learning those. And I don't know if that was the same for you or... <laughs> I mean, absolutely. I mean, I, I almost want to take everything that you just said and play it for my students next year at the beginning of a course, because I feel like it's such valuable information, such valuable advice about like, um, you know, uh, repositioning who is in front of the classroom as a learner as well as someone mm -hmm. who's not a deity in any way re, you know repositioning what the purpose of the university is and, and its history repositioning the the value of the work in that space versus the value of work outside that space and in fact what makes impact right mm -hmm. I mean again we can go back to your conversation about sins invalid right as just you know uh in almost in consultation with academia, but so much outside of academia and creating, you know, essentially a new framework for thinking about um, intersectionality with disability. So absolutely. Yeah, and I find, I don't know if you find this, but disability justice conceptually is something students can grab. 
Yeah. Because it's it's not just abstract. Like like you said, it's informed by academia, but it's informed through the lens of what's happening in the real world. So making those connections is easy. And, and then in turn, you can kind of start to see recommendations and solutions for the problems we have. It's not just, you know, one of my frustrations when I first went to grad school is everything felt like an exercise in what's wrong with the world, but there was just no room. It's like, well, you just throw up your hands because <laughs> this is the way it is. And it's like, well, th that can't be an answer. <laughs> I mean, absolutely. I mean, I think for me, disability justice has brought in climate justice and disability into conversations that are so important. And of course, as soon as we talk about climate change, we can't not talk about the pandemic, right? Mm -hmm. in, in itself, a consequence of like the warming planet and our interactions with animals and all those kinds of things. So for me, disability justice is also helping us unpack the pandemic, right? And, mm -hmm. um, and yeah, it's incredibly valuable. Um, approach. Yeah, and I think it's an exercise in how we can be theoretical and still be accessible. Exactly. Because I, I think in academia, um, there's, I think we're made to feel uncomfortable, and things are made inaccessible, and we're made to feel there's something wrong for us if we can't work with that. Um, and I don't know what's behind that. <laughs> Uh, I'm probably like 900 years of like entrenched, you know, like ableism. It's like, you know, yeah. and like, I'm like the, I don't know, the love of jargon or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so let's get out of here. Let's get out of academia. Let's go outside the project, outside the work, outside the arc in segment three, where we talk a little bit about, you know, your life outside of the work that you do. Um, I want to know who is the most famous person you've met and what that experience was like. You know, I, I haven't met a lot of famous people. Um, I did not meet, but when I was in high school um, and reading was always a little bit more difficult for me having learning disability. So it took me a, a really long time to learn to read. Um, and I actually learned to read through comic books, which I love because the, the merging of sort of the visual with the words was just a catalyst for my brain. To I have to interrupt because like I learned to read 100% as a, someone who has a learning disability too, 100% because of Archie comics. Oh my goodness. I still have my boxes of Archie comics and I can't part with them. <laughs> Hundreds of them. I have hundreds of them. <laughs> oh my goodness. I, I absolutely love hearing that because I wish more people understood the power of comics. Uh, it is, you know, in many ways accessible in a way that books they put in the curriculum aren't. Um, and I just wish, wish more teachers and early educators would introduce graphic novels and comics and things like that. Because I think a lot of us with learning disabilities who just a page of word is clutter, um, we would be able to grab onto things like that. So my mom I love hearing you say that. <laughs> my mom tells this story about uh, how um, I used to be able to uh, trick them into thinking I was reading because I would be, I would actually just look at the picture and I would make up the story and it would be somewhat close to what the words are saying. And so they'd be like, oh, so he can read a little bit. And it's like, no, I was just, you know, the, the, the story was in the images. And yeah. so it was, it's like this interesting way of how like, you know, just, you know, the images already gave me the story. What was disabling was in fact the, the construction of the words. Yeah. 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 And what I sort of love about your story too is, um, you know, being able to make up a story. Like if, if you have learning disabilities, like I can get into my imagination pretty quickly and it, take a fantastic ride. Yeah. So that piece, like the enjoyment, if you don't know the words and you get to make up your own story that kind of parallels what you're seeing, but lets you sort of flex those creative muscles, like that's, that's a fun ride. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Sorry, I interrupted. You were telling us about the famous person. Oh, I went off on a tangent. So it, it took me a long time to get comfortable with reading. And I really, there were a lot of things I didn't connect with. Um, and I sort of found that over my whole life. I really like concrete things. I don't like abstract things. Um, so we read in high school, uh, Maya Angelou's I Know Why the Cage Bird Sings. Um, and just something about how incredibly poetic it was really, really spoke to me. It was sort of one of those rare books that jumped out at me. And then just by chance, she happened to be coming through Ottawa 
doing a speaking tour and I asked my mom and my mom got tickets and took me and I didn't get to meet Maya Angelou, but I remember listening to her speak. I remember the feeling it gave me. I remember sort of looking around the theater, the colors on the wall, like it is such a vivid image. And it was one of those sort of early times, because when you're younger, you don't have access. You really have what people give you. And then somehow this book made it into the curriculum and I read it and it spoke to me in a very specific way. And then I got to hear Maya Angelou speak and it was like goosebumps. Mm. It was like this person who spoke differently about the world than anybody else, kind of similar to going into a disability studies class. Um, And I think probably it was my early connections to sociology and understanding oppression like those were the things that were really speaking to me um so didn't meet but that was like a really important moment those things kind of coming together because I had success with a book (laughs) and it spoke to me and I understood it and then just sort of seeing the author and kind of being inspired by and then learning about the life's work and stuff and it really showed me different possibilities than I had seen before I absolutely love that story. That's so almost like a full circle, right? And and I'm so like, I'm so, I want to give your mom like a high five for getting the tickets. You know what I mean? Like, it's such a, it's such a, you know, that she, she said, yes, let's go. Let's do this. Um, yeah, she bought me all my comic books too. So I really have yeah. to give credit to my mom because I struggled a lot and, and neither one of my parents um, finished high school. Um, So their relationship with with education was a little bit different and they didn't have great experiences. And when I was struggling reading and I was held back and I had to go like to summer school and all these things. And she just, you know, recognized that I loved Archie comics and she used to go around the city and she would go to use bookstores and other places, garage sales and just buy me. And I have boxes and boxes of them because she recognized what are you motivated to read and what makes you feel good? And we're just going to give you all that and don't worry about anything else. Mm -hmm. And had it not been for that, I mean, you know, when I think of who I was early in life, if somebody had said that person's going to do their PhD one day, that ridiculous. Like I I couldn't even, you know, make it through the day in a classroom. Like, so, so I'm I'm glad that you kind of prompted me to, to give a little shout out to my mom because She's sort of always been open to, you know, you want to see that person, let's get tickets. You like comics, let's buy more. (laughs) I love that. So um, is there an obscure fact you carry around and one that you pull out in conversation when there's a lull? I I feel like everything I know is obscure, (laughs) is an obscure fact. And probably to the people around me when I'm talking about it, it sounds that way. But like... (laughs) I mean, if I'm really going out there and thinking really obscure, because I'm, I'm a little bit of a nerd, um, I like that B. Arthur was in the Star Wars holiday special. I love that Star Wars and the Golden Girls in this universe, like it delights me. I love that, I that too. Like a, get like a six degrees of separation there. Like, I like that. I don't know if it's interesting for other people, but I like we live in a world where that happened. So this is, what is this a a Star Wars special? There was a Star Wars holiday special. It only aired once. Um, Huge embarrassment. You can find it now on YouTube. I think George Lucas tried to bury it because it's it's weird. Like if you are bored and you have the time and want to go to YouTube and watch the Star Wars holiday special, like the fact that they came from that to the Star Wars universe now that's like respected and people enjoy those stories. Like it is a wild and weird ride. It was a television special. It made no sense whatsoever. There were parts that were animated. There were parts that weren't. There's a whole backstory about Chewbacca's family. Like, and I remember for years, my sister and I had watched it and then it got buried. And this is before the internet. So we always used to kind of talk, like we'd talk about it, like, like we didn't imagine this, like we watched this, right? <laughs> um, and I think it wasn't until I was in my early twenties that like a bar did a night where they got a hold of like a bootleg copy and you could go watch it. And I was like, it exists. <laughs> so amazing. this is all obscure facts I've shared with you. I love the it. whole thing. 
<laughs> I love it. Um, now I have to go watch it. So that's the that's yeah. The thing. Well, we'll talk about it later. <laughs> <laughs> sure, I'd love to. <laughs> Um, what are you reading now? What's on your nightstand or on your ebook? You know, I have a, I have a stack of unfinished books. I'm really, really bad at starting and not finishing books. Um, I, I still really like, uh, graphic novels and comics. Uh, the Ottawa public library has a great selection. So sometimes what I'll do is I'll wait till like a run of, of a series is over and they've bound it. Uh, and then I'll just get those and read them. And I, I, I love, I sort of love the new wave in comics, like the Miss Marvel. And, you know, I, I kind of think when I was younger, if, if there had been like a young Muslim superhero who was part of the Avengers, like that would have blown my young mind. <laughs> um, so I, I like to read stuff that's fun to, to counter it. Um, and it sort of counters some of the heavy stuff, but I've, I've, you know, I, I don't want to say I've read anything completely because I think everything on my nightstand is unfinished right now. And I've started it and then got distracted by, you know, Miss Marvel or something. Totally fair. Um, is there something that you do that brings you joy? Uh, like a, a hobby or a practice or, or something that just brings you joy? You know, I've started just because of COVID, there's not much you can do. So I've started going for sort of, I do like an evening walk and I've been hiking more and I, I, it makes me realize I like nature. I like to be outdoors. I like sort of that time to think. Um, and I almost wish I had realized that a little earlier because I think an end of the day, a little bit of fresh air and having time to think is really useful and decompress. It sort of takes me outside of whatever grind <laughs> I'm in. Um, so I've really been enjoying that. I got into feeding squirrels um, throughout COVID, which I really, really enjoy. Uh, I, I've got to sort of roll it back a little bit because I think I've artificially um, grown the squirrel population on my block. And uh, a lot of my neighbors are not happy about that. <laughs> um, but I, I, I enjoy that. I, I like nature. I'm pretty, it, it you know, it doesn't take much to feel joy. I think if you can just take a step back and I find some that. beauty in the little things. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. So, and finally, how I end um, every podcast, um, and I'll end this, this the same way. Um, how do you think disability can save the world? Well, I think it goes back to, to what we were talking about and what you said, like disability is a natural and valued part of the human condition. Um, a large number of us either have disabilities or will experience disability. So I think it changes the world when we push back against notions um, that it's unexpected or unwanted. Uh, Cause I think it changes and, and it has that sort of with disability justice, it has that ripple effect that expands outwards. Um, where I just think if you can sort of center disability um, and understand why certain bodies haven't been valued and why they've been excluded, it opens up the possibility for really a better life for all of us. And you had mentioned sort of care earlier. And I think one of the ways disability can inform our understanding is that it can let us see that we all, we give care and we receive care. Like that is a natural part of the human experience. We're not people who care and people who are cared for, but we're, we are both those things. Like there's no dichotomy. So I think Disability has so many ways it can inform how we understand the human experience. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I really did appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks to Jihan for coming on the podcast. Get in touch by sending us an email at disabilitysavestheworld at gmail.com. If you're interested in learning more about me, you can check out my website, fadishinuda.com. This podcast is hosted and produced by me, Fadi Shinuda, and edited by Yasmina Martinez. Thank you for listening and see you next time on Disability Saves the World.